The name is Jonathan Cerna, also known as the Jonah Gaze. I've been shooting photo and video now for over 12 years, and some of my favorite subjects have been sports, adventures, and the outdoors, among documenting the everyday life. I do have a couple of years experience as a professional under my belt, and in those years, I've shot weddings, events, vacation rental advertisements, short films, and documentaries. Nowadays, I have a different liking. I love telling the stories of all things nature, especially by way of natural history and wildlife behavior. And in this YouTube channel, I get out in the wild to do just that. So follow me on my journey as an aspiring natural history and wildlife filmmaker, and let's get out in the wild together. I'm making this video for myself so I can have a consolidated view of my headspace when it comes to using this gear. And the gear I use is part of the Fujifilm system. And I think the niche of storytelling that I'm in, which is natural history and wildlife stories, is pretty small when it comes to users in the Fujifilm system. And I want to create this video as a way to voice my thoughts comments, concerns, and experience so that way I can contribute to the growth of the brand and hopefully as they continue to grow they continue to serve my needs as a creative. I won't be talking about technical specs because I think that these cameras photographically speaking are perfect tools. When it comes to video on the other hand you'll see the rest in the video. But when you want to see technical specs, go and watch some other people that do it better. I have one YouTuber that I would recommend. His name is Christopher Ray. He's new. He created a video recently about his experience choosing a Fujifilm X-T4 versus full-frame contemporaries. And it's a pretty funny video, well-informed, and he's got the specs if you need them. With all that being said, this video is going to be in four parts. First is going to be pros. Second is going to be cons. Third is going to be an elaboration of some problems I've faced and some limited solutions that I have. And then fourth is going to be some concluding thoughts to wrap up the whole video. Yeah. The first pro is going to go by pretty quick because it's on the cameras and lenses being small and lightweight. And right now I have the Fujifilm XS10 and I have it paired with a small rig L bracket grip and the Deity D3 microphone. So it went from a smaller setup to something more substantial in terms of its weight and its protection. So you could of course build these smaller cameras up. But starting from that small form factor, I really appreciate that because I used to shoot on a full frame DSLR, the Canon 5D Mark II. And I had it paired with a Sigma 35mm f1.4, which was a big setup that was heavy which wasn't necessarily a problem but as you go through the entire day it can definitely become encumbering but above the size and the weight what was really more of a problem was the camera being acknowledged when you have a bigger camera and you have a bigger lens people become more aware of the fact now of course when I'm out in the wild shooting wildlife it can also become sort of a nuisance to the animals themselves especially when you're shooting on a telephoto end and you have a lens that's big, bright white, which of course can be alleviated with covers and whatnot, but what I enjoy about these smaller mirrorless cameras is that they're small from the get-go, and it's a great way to be able to facilitate candid moments, and it enables me to capture them without having to force a situation and whatnot. Now another pro that I really love are their colors. Fujifilm colors are great, and I think it's in part due to their film simulations, which are largely like picture profiles on other different cameras like sepia, black and white, faithful, landscape and whatnot. But these are created with a little bit more deliberation because they create them with a sense of film stock in mind. And what I mean by that is some of their recipes emulate Superior, Portra, or even Ektachrome. And there are even people out there right now that are making their own recipes. For example, I'm shooting on one called Kodak Portra 400 from Fuji X Weekly. And it's a classic chrome based emulation. Mine's a little different. I have a little bit more of a warmer tone to it and lower contrast right now, especially with this light. 
But nonetheless, I love having these straight out of the camera technicalities so that way I can focus on what's in front of me now versus think about how I'm going to change the image later in post. It really helps me understand that story is the most important versus having to worry about the logistics of post-production. So the last pro that I want to part with is my admiration for their design philosophy. And there's no better way to acknowledge it than to bring up a documentary called Camera Punk, which is created by Fujifilm users Minzy Tan and Pally Schultz. I apologize if I butchered the names. But the documentary is great because it follows the production of a camera called the X-Pro3 which is a polarizing camera for its design features. And there in three part is what I think. The first part is that the camera is a rangefinder styled camera. And it has a optical viewfinder as well as an electronic viewfinder. So it's a hybrid system. Second is that it's durable and rugged, yet it looks sleek and classic. Three is that the most polarizing of them all really is that the LCD screen for playback is always hidden. You can only view your footage and photos if you were to tilt the screen out 90 degrees. Which is crazy to me, ergonomically speaking, of course. But I think what they were trying to do was enable a sort of traditional experience, one that it kind of beckons film photography or cinema cameras, because there was no instant playback when they first were created. And I think what that instant playback or the elimination of instant playback does is helps us better understand what it is in front of us, the composition, the lighting, the exposure, and also the story largely that's being told. If you're interested in learning more about the philosophy and the design aspect of those cameras, I definitely urge you to check them out. So as much as I like being out in the wild, especially when it comes to the local wild, it's getting hot. Triple digit heat is upon us. It's now noon and I've been here for too long. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish the rest of this video back at home. Now that I'm back at home, we can move on to the cons of my list, which is going to be more focused on the video side of the system versus the photographic. Because as I said earlier, these cameras are built perfectly, at least to my needs when it comes to photography. Yet on the other hand, video needs some work. The first con is going to be on autofocus performance which is largely hit or miss especially depending on the lenses that I'm using for example with this 18 millimeter f2 pancake lens which is about 10 years old I always shoot manual focus when it comes to video because it just hunts way too much and it has a lot of sound that gets recorded even on my shotgun mic with that being said I have tried to combat it by messing with the continuous autofocus settings but as for right now, I haven't found anything that is more reliable than me just setting up a manual focus shot. And the second con brings me to talking about the lens designs just not being video oriented. Most of the lenses perform quite well when it comes to photographic needs, but my main gripe with them is that with the focus ring, the focus rings on all the lenses I've had so far are horrible. Their focusing mechanism is based off of a fly-by-wire system, so it's all electronically coupled. There's no physical or mechanical feedback that we're receiving on our end when we pull the focus on the lens. So the last con that I'm going to briefly mention is that I recently acquired the 16 to 80 millimeter lens and people were talking about how it's a video oriented lens however my biggest gripe with it is that when you zoom in or zoom out there is a sort of change in the image quality because there's like a wobbling effect that occurs that just isn't pleasant it's very distracting and on top of that there is exposure changes as if the aperture that's constant the constant f4 aperture is not taking place there's some sort of exposure changing still happening and I've read online and I've heard that a lot of the problems point to in-camera lens corrections, which, okay, fine, have those corrections, but it's still a problem. 
And unfortunately, there hasn't been any to the point or clear solution to get around this problem. This particular con is one that I really hope that they address later on because to me, it seems like something that is, of course, in camera and should be fixed in firmware. Now, they just released a lens. It's the 18 to 120 power zoom lens, and it seems like they fixed all the cons that I'm mentioning here in this video, but there still is the problem that's existed prior to the release of that lens, which is what I'm explaining here. What they should be doing is addressing the problem first and foremost. And if they're working on a solution, update us. If they haven't yet, let us know if they will down the line. Whether it be some sort of software or hardware issue, they should really communicate with us that it isn't possible to fix in the first place. Now, most of the cons that I've listed have some workarounds that limit our creativity, of course, but still have some troubleshooting involved that can help us move forward. However, there is one major problem about the focusing performance that I think I can pose a very solid solution to. The problem I'm referring to is the extremely long focus throw of their lenses. And I've had this experience myself with most of my lenses, namely the 50 to 230 millimeter telephoto lens that I have. It's extremely hard to go from infinity to macro focus without having to turn the focus ring over and over and over again. I don't even know how many times. And it's even harder to have a repeatable focus pull. The best focusing results that I've had in my tests is to set the mode of operation for focusing. There are two modes. There's the linear response and then the nonlinear response. I want to make it clear that these terms are not related to the lens's focus motor, but rather the focus operation on the camera itself. And I have to read off my notes here because these are definitions. Linear response refers to rotation measured by an unspecific amount of travel distance between close and infinity focus, whereas nonlinear is dictated by the speed of rotation. My number one solution to this problem is to release a firmware update where we can program the lenses ourselves by the degree of rotation. I saw this feature on Panasonic cameras where they were able to program that degree of rotation on their lenses anywhere between 90 degrees to 180 to I think even 360, which is great because that allows us for either precision or for us to be able to travel and repeat focus pulls at a more efficient rate. My number two solution that I have might be a bit more expensive for them to execute, but I think it's a little bit more practical because it deals with physical design. And that physical design I'm talking about is a focus clutch mechanism. I haven't used them personally, at least on projects. I've went to the store to try them out but I really love the focus clutch on the 16 millimeter and the 23 millimeter because there's hard stops for focusing, which would prove great for focusing in video especially. That way, control is within our hands versus having to rely on some computational focus by wire system. To wrap up this video, I think Fujifilm is a very well-rounded system. With the recent release of the X-H2S and two new lenses, an idea of where they're going to go with their future roadmap, I think there's a lot of potential growth, both as individual users and for the company itself. If I were to provide some sort of counterpart as to another system I would buy into, if not Fujifilm, I would probably go to Micro Four Thirds, namely Panasonic. Although Olympus is great too, the recent switch from Olympus to OM systems makes me a bit skeptical into investing in them. And as we all know, cameras are quite the investment itself. Above all, I am a creative that is looking for their needs in natural history and wildlife storytelling to be met. And I think Fujifilm is on their way to really providing me something great. I understand that Fujifilm is not the leader of the camera industry, but a niche rather that can help independent 
individuals enjoy a creative experience that's not encumbered by the fuss or the frills of this technological rat race. Their company that produces their camera products with both the future and the past in mind. And with that being said, I really appreciate their ability to deliver a product that caters to my needs of today's standards, as well as maintaining that sense of tradition when it comes to that creative process that is photography and filmmaking.